Well, hello again. Uh, we're going to continue on looking at uh, Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount today in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, so let's pray and ask God for his help as we do that. Lord Almighty, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you that we can come to know you and know your love for us in Jesus through it. Thank you that you reveal your will for our lives, uh, how we are to live as your people in light of the grace and love and mercy you have shown us. And we pray that your spirit helps us do that, Lord. Helps us to be kingdom people. Uh, Lord God, and we pray this for your glory and in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to keep reading Matthew chapter 5. Uh, we're going to start at verse 27. So if you want to open your Bibles, uh, please do. Uh, all the words will be on a screen right now. Let's uh, read God's word. Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Well, uh, sex and sexual ethics are a big topic today. Uh, we, we, our culture seems to think that we live in a sexually liberated time. Uh, the same-sex marriage debate has only just recently happened you know, through history. Uh, there are all sorts of questions going on around this sort of uh, topic. And Jesus' teaching here often seems uh, to, to the average punter's eyes stifling or backwards or, uh, yeah. But this is Jesus speaking. This is God's way, the kingdom way. Right? And once again, Jesus states the law as it was revealed in the Old Testament. Right? And another well-known command, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. And once again, uh, Jesus has that authority because he is our Emmanuel. He is God with us. He says, but I tell you, in verse 28, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And a lot of people read this and they go, oh, come on. Really? How, how can Jesus say that? Like how, how can he lay that on us? And I think we need to understand, again, what the point is. Right? Jesus is getting to the heart of the issue. Right? The actual act of adultery is the end of the road. The beginning of that road, well, it begins in the heart. It's adultery of the heart. Now, this is not just an issue for blokes, it's an issue for girls. Uh, and increasingly, uh, with the issue of pornography, you know, women are viewing it just as much as men. Um, and you know, often, uh, women fantasize uh, in a different way to blokes. Um, and, but we need to understand something as well here, uh, so that we're not um, misunderstanding what Jesus is, is, is saying here. You know, it's not the glance that's sinful. You know, you see a, a pretty woman or a, a handsome gentleman down the street and you and you might see them and you go, oh, wow, okay. They're, they're a beautiful person or whatever. That's not the point of what Jesus is saying. What he is saying is that you have that second glance and then you play with that thought in your mind. Well, then you might be getting into trouble. Then the heart comes into play. I think C.S. Lewis uh, said it best uh, when he explains this kind of dynamic. Uh, and he used 
uh, two of my favorite things, bacon and eggs. Uh, he said this, C.S. Lewis, he said, If I look upon bacon and eggs and my mouth begins to water, then I know I have committed breakfast in my heart. I'll say it again. If I look upon bacon and eggs and my mouth begins to water, then I know I have committed breakfast in my heart. You see what he's saying? That thought can go. It can come in and go. Or it can linger. And it can bring about a desire in our hearts. And once we've let it do that, well, then we've committed something that Jesus says is the equivalent of adultery. We've lusted. Uh, Verses 29 to 30 uh, introduce us to a principle that becomes applicable across uh, the whole life of faith. Um, You know, Jesus was exaggerating here for effect, um, although some uh, people through the centuries have taken it quite literally. Um, you know, there are examples of monks who would self-flagellate, um, um, causing pain and all sorts of stuff. But Jesus here is exaggerating for effect. And basically he's saying is if, if something is getting in the way of you following Jesus, then get rid of it. That's what he's saying. If something is stopping you from living the kingdom life, get rid of it. And Jesus says the same thing twice. He uses the image of an eye and a hand. But he says the same thing twice. And so what's he doing? He's ramming home this point. He's emphasizing something that we really need to stop and take notice of. What he's saying is is that the stakes are high. In fact, they don't get any higher. The stakes are our eternal destiny. Hell is real. No one speaks about hell more than Jesus. Because he understands that he's come to save us from it. And Jesus says, if you're going to keep living uh, without Jesus as your Lord, keep, uh, keep living as if he, he doesn't matter, then hell is what awaits. But you know what? If you're going to be following Jesus, it's better you to get rid of that stuff. That stuff that's stopping you. And to spend eternity... Without him. The stakes are high. Now having redefined what it means to be faithful. uh, In terms of getting to the heart of the issue. Jesus goes on to teach us just how important God's view of marriage really is. I mean we shouldn't read these verses on divorce and think you know God's giving us an out. No, Jesus is emphasizing just how important God's view of marriage actually is. Yes, it's true in the Old Testament there was this, uh, in Deuteronomy, there was a, you know, a, um, a provision for divorce. Uh, but even in Jesus' day, it seems that people were abusing that. I mean, the consumerist culture in which we live is nothing new. All right, you know, what happens when something's not satisfying us? What happens when something breaks? Uh, What do we do as a 21st century Australian? We chuck it out and we go get a new one, or we upgrade, or we update. And it's amazing how much that culture influences our view of marriage. But you know what? God is the author of marriage. We should look to Him if we're going to live kingdom lives, and have a look at what he says about marriage. Because marriage was this institution that uh, that God created before the fall. It's something that he wove into creation. People sometimes say, well, you know, look at the Old Testament. Um, The Old Testament was fine with, you know, blokes having multiple wives, blokes having... Uh, concubines and mistresses and and all that sort of stuff. And I think when people say that, they haven't really read the Old Testament very closely. Let's take a few examples. Uh, When we see, for instance, in Genesis, uh, Abraham um, basically take Hagar as another wife. Or Jacob and and the issues he he faces when he has Leah and Rachel uh, as both his wives. What happens? Conflict. Uh, 
issues arise uh, that uh, point out just how wrong these situations are. Yes, there's a sense in which they're not condemned for that. But the Bible paints us a picture that whenever God's uh, intended plan for marriage isn't followed, trouble happens. Um, Think about David and Bathsheba. Think about Solomon and all his wives. Uh, It was from that that the kingdom went into decay and split. Yes, okay, the Bible in the Old Testament and the ancient world seemed to allow for this uh, situation of, of multiple wives and all that sort of stuff. But it never paints a picture that that is God's way. It always paints a picture that when, that, when th- those things are happening, it leads to trouble. You know, Jesus, in these verses, makes an allowance for divorce. Um, but it should never be entertained lightly. We live in a culture that throws things away all too easily, including marriage. Jesus wants us to have a high view of marriage because marriage is a picture of the gospel. Jesus is our bridegroom who commits himself wholly and solely to us. And we are the church. We, the church, are his bride. Scripture uses this metaphor. We are his bride. And and how did the bridegroom demonstrate his complete and utter faithfulness to his bride? How did the bridegroom, Jesus, demonstrate his complete and utter love for his bride? He gave his life for his bride. He died for her. Kingdom people seek to live kingdom lives, fixing their eyes on Jesus. And that's mean, that means we're faithful with our eyes so that we're faithful with our hearts, so that we're faithful in all our relationships. For that is what Jesus was with us, completely and utterly faithful. Let's pray. Lord Almighty, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he is our faithful King who came in obedience to you who is the fulfillment of all your promises. And he faithfully went to the cross for his bride, the church. He faithfully demonstrated his love in the most amazing way by dying for our sins and rising again. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. And we pray that your spirit would work in our hearts so that we would be faithful people too so that we would live lives in response to the grace and mercy you have shown us in Jesus, lives that demonstrate that we are salt and light in this world, lives that demonstrate that we are people of the King as we seek to live faithful lives in all our relationships. And we pray this for your glory and in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next week.